Hello everyone and welcome to this Blender tutorial where we're going to see how to create this procedural crystal material from scratch, step by step. By the way, in the tutorial I'll show you how to make it in the Blender EV render engine, but this material should also work in cycles. Okay, so let's say that I have this simple crystal mesh. You see that it's basically just an assembly of stretch cubes with pointy heads and a pack of rocks at the bottom. Our goal today will be to give this entire object a single material, which here I've already named crystal and that is assigned to this object, and what we want is mainly to have this material use the vertical position of the vertex in the mesh to determine the color that the material should have and how transparent it should be. This way we'll get more rock-like visuals at the bottom and more magical crystal transparent visuals at the top. Alright, so let's open the shader editor for our material and for now you see that it just contains Blender's default principled BSDF node, which is an easy way to create PBR, so physically based rendered materials. That's nice, because it means that, first of all, we can boost the shininess of our material by increasing the specular value and reducing the roughness to a minimum. So this is going to make a shiny crystal that reflects the lights around. Then let's add a bit of transparency to our object by upping the transmission value, with some transmission roughness as well, because we don't actually want it to look like glass. Also, if you want, you can reduce the alpha of the material, but in that case, because we're working in the EV render engine, you'll need to go to your material settings and change its blend mode to one that supports alpha. And more precisely, here we need to use the alpha hashed and not the alpha blend mode, otherwise we'll get some weird visual artifacts later on. But in any case, at that point, we have a slightly transparent greyish material that still looks nothing like crystal. Most notably, we don't have this inner light that really gives the whole magical look. To do this, the trick will be to give our material some emission. Indeed, you see that if I set the emission color of the principled BSDF to some orange tint, the crystal becomes emissive. And if we enable the bloom option in our EV scene, and then I increase the emission strength, then this emission turns into a really neat glow effect. The higher the emission strength, the more glow our crystal produces, but of course for now, we just have a big orange blob that doesn't look very crystally either. To solve this, the first step will be to have this emission color change depending on where we are at in the crystal. And more precisely, we're going to say that at the top of the crystal we have a lighter emission, and thus it will be more glowy and more emissive, and at the bottom of our object we use darker colors that are less flashy and less emissive. Now, to compute this vertex-vertical ratio, we needed to start by adding a geometry node to our graph, which gives us, among other things, the position of our current shading point, so our current vertex, in global world coordinates. Meaning that if we use a separate XYZ node to extract just the Z component, we're getting the vertical position of our point in the world. We can check that it's actually what we want by adding a color ramp node afterwards, for example with dark red on the left and a brighter orange on the right, and then plug this into our emission slot in the principled BSDF. And sure enough, you see that we do get a vertical gradient that is red at the bottom of our object and orange at the top. Note that if you want to compute this gradient in local coordinates and not global coordinates, or in other words you want it to be relative to the position of the vertex inside the object instead of the position inside the whole scene, you can simply subtract the position of the object itself from this geometry position like this. Okay, so that's cool, but if we bring this red mark on the left closer to the right, you'll notice something a bit annoying. Right now, the max height isn't really the top of our mesh, but one unit up the z-axis, meaning that this is as high as our gradient can go. 
To fix this, we need to divide a vertical position by the height of the mesh, which in our case is a little over 5.5. By the way, as a quick side note, I personally don't know of any simple way of getting the dimensions of your meshes in shader graphs in Blender, apart from using geometry nodes to store some custom attributes on the object. So here I'm just going to write it down as is in a value node, but if you have some nice tips about that, don't hesitate to leave them in the comments, of course. But in any case, at this stage, we're able to pick various emission colors for our crystal, depending on the height of the current vertex, and adapt the emission strength to get a more or less flashy glow. Okay, so that's nice, but of course, it's way too basic to really give a feel of natural minerals. That's why the next step is to add a noise texture to the whole thing to make this a bit more realistic. So let's start by adding a new noise texture node in our graph. Note that if you enable the built-in Node Wrangler plugin in your user preferences, then you'll be able to press Ctrl plus Shift and click on this node to preview what this specific element looks like on its own. Now this noise is interesting and it will definitely add some dirtiness and realism to a crystal, but we're not quite there yet. In particular, this noise is too subtle as is. Everything is just tints of light greys and whites. To boost the contrast, let's use a color ramp node with a darker grey color and bring our handles closer together. This instantly exaggerates our noise and creates more interesting patches. We can get an even better result by playing with our noise parameters and mainly increasing the detail and roughness values. Okay. Now, suppose that we just multiply the output of this color ramp from our noise with the one that we had before for the vertical color gradient, and then we plug the result of this multiplication in our emission color slot. This creates a pretty nice effect in our material that looks way more like natural rocks or crystals. Of course, we can then do something similar for our transmission value too, because if we create another color ramp based on the vertical ratio of our current vertex, and we tweak its marks and its mode a little, then you see we can get a vertical gradient that goes from black to white, and thus that can give a 0 to 1 value for our transmission, 0 being fully opaque and at the bottom. So again, we'll multiply it with our noise color ramp, and we'll plug this in the transmission slot of the principal PSDF. And finally, we'll just remultiply our color result by this new black and white gradient, so that the bottom of our crystal looks more like a pack of non-emissive rocks. Now, because we've severely reduced the impact of our emission color on a big chunk of our model, it can be a good idea to now boost the emission strength overall. This will make sure that the glow that comes from the top of our crystals is still flashy enough to create the magical effect that we want. So at that point, we're starting to have a pretty cool effect, and actually, depending on the type of crystals that you want to make, you might want to stop there and just play around with the noise and the color ramps. For example, this one allows you to change the colors of your crystals. But in this tutorial, I want to go a bit further and improve this procedural material even more by adding some cracks and turbulence in those crystals. First, let's work on the cracks. For that, we can use another type of noise, called a Voronoi texture. That's a very interesting mathematical noise that can produce very different types of results, and in particular, when you use the Distance to Edge mode in Blender, it creates this kind of organic cell grid. We can change its size and randomness to adjust the pattern to our liking, and just like we did before, we can link it to a color ramp to better control the contrast. Then, to create the turbulence effect, we'll just reuse the noise texture node that we studied before, except that this time we'll up the distortion option, for example, to 3 or so. Finally, to mix those two noises together, we just have to multiply them, and we get these cracks and turbulence patterns that will give way more visual appeal to our crystals. Although, for now, you notice that the patterns we want to add to our base color are black, and it would actually be better to have them in white. 
so we want to invert the color. To do this, we're going to use yet another color ramp, so we'll add it just after the multiply node, and flip our colors around, and also add some contrast to those effects. Last but not least, we need to compose or mix these new patterns with our previous computations. For that, we can use the mix node in color mode, and plug our base color from before in the A slot. Then we'll leave the B slot to this light color, and we'll use our cracks and turbulence as the factor value. Basically, this means that we're taking our base color, and then wherever our patterns are close to white, this node will mix it with the light tint in our B slot the most. Now, if we just try to plug this mix result in our emission color slot, we get, well, a pretty unreadable mess of flashy whites. And that's because, with this default mix mode, our shader is putting way too much white in our emission color, and so the glow effect is blending everything in a fuzzy flashy cloud. The solution here is to use another function in our mix node, and more precisely, the color dodge operation. This way, you see that our cracks and turbulences are embedded in the base color, and so we've just created lighter patterns that are still properly included in the original effect. Of course, you can then play with the color ramp marks in those additional effects to control how visible they are and get something that you really like. Now to finish this material, a last quick win that can really improve this shader is to give our material some displacement. If you're not too familiar with this concept, it's basically a way to simulate imperfections on the surface of your geometry to make it more realistic, like bumps or creases, without having to actually model this extra geometry and thus weigh your model down with too much triangles. Instead, displacement will fake the light interactions that this extra geometry would produce in a lighter and more efficient way. So this displacement is computed as a 3D vector, and you can add it to your Blender material by plugging it in the Material Output node in this blue pin at the bottom. Typically, in our case, a very simple way to boost our visuals is to take those new cracks and turbulence effects that we just computed and connect them to a displacement node. Then, we'll take the output of this node and plug it in the displacement pin of the material output. And there we go! You see that our crystals and pack of rocks now look way more realistic, cause it actually seems like they're composed of many layers and they've lived through ages. Now, just a side note, displacement isn't a perfect solution, and it's not always as easy to apply as it was here. But in this case, and more generally when you're doing some natural mineral materials, it's usually a quick and easy way of upgrading your material. Alright, so here we are. Our procedural crystal material is now finished. So just to wrap up the tutorial and reflect back on what we just did, let's go through our graph and group those nodes into organized frames. At the core of our shader is the computation of the vertical ratio of our current vertex, meaning how high it is in the world on the z-axis as a normalized 0-1 value. This is then used by our base emission color ramp to get a vertical gradient with darker tones at the bottom and lighter tones that are more emissive at the top. To that, we then add a basic noise that makes the whole thing more realistic by adding imperfections and various dirt marks on the surface. It's mixed with the base color using a simple series of multiplications. Similarly, the vertical ratio of the vertex also impacts the transmission value of the shader, so that the bottom points are more opaque and the top ones are more transparent. Finally, the bottom part of the graph is what creates the cracks and turbulence effects on the surface of the crystals. These further boost the realism of the shader, and they're used both in the emission color computation, thanks to a color dodge mix operation, and for the displacement. As a final note, the cool thing with the shader is that, parallel to tweaking just each and every parameter in each and every node to perfectly adjust the visuals to your needs, you can still very easily change the color of the crystals 
just by updating this color ramp node. But anyway, that's it for today. And you now have a cool procedural crystal material that works both in EV and in cycles. I really hope you enjoyed this Blender tutorial and that you learned a few things. If you did, feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel to not miss the next ones. And of course, if you have other ideas of cool Blender tricks that you'd like to learn, tell me in the comments. As usual, thanks a lot for watching, and take care.